Okay, so then we're going to start with problem number six. Uh, you have all the data for the PKA model. And uh, uh, what I uh, propose that you do is that you have a column which is time going from one minute to 60 minutes. And then you put these three equations in three different columns so you can compute fracture half length, width, and net pressure as a function of time. <coughs> uh, be careful that you have a two wing injection rate, okay? So remember the definition of I here is just one wing. So the first part is just replacing uh, these constants and putting those into those equations to calculate that as a function of time. I like that you plot that. And the second part is more like a volumetrics uh, exercise. From all that volume, we would like to know how much water and how much sand we need uh, to put inside that fracture. <coughs> so uh, please uh, get started on s with solving that problem, and I'll distribute your exams as you solve that, OK? <coughs> so let me or Muhammad know if you have any questions. So that should be an easy problem, guys. Uh, remember, I recommend that you use the metric units, and then you convert that to whatever you want. But don't try to do unit conversion with all those exponents, because it's going to be uh, quite a mess. Yes. Yes, yes, you have to do that.
So guys, I uploaded the, the key of the of the midterm. And uh, just check, you know, that your grades add up correctly. And uh, if you have any any questions, uh, you should uh, <coughs> you should send me an email and explain what what's wrong with your exam. You can take a picture also of the, the part in which uh, you think there is there is a problem. Alright guys, how is it going?
All right, guys. You have you have something already. What about uh, fractured half length? Yes. 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 So, uh, let me start this. Okay, uh, this, this is not exactly the same problem because fracture height is different, but this is what I'm asking you to do. Uh, first thing is to convert all your quantities in field units to SI units. Okay? And after you do that, uh, and you have your times, uh, you're gonna have to put in the SI units, also you need seconds here, okay? You cannot use minutes, you cannot use hours. Uh, remember that SI unit, the basic one, also goes by MKS, which is meter kilogram second. 
So all the quantities here should be a combination of meter, kilogram, and second. Pascal it is, it is right, because it's kilogram divided meter square, and all the others are just meter and seconds. So when you put all of, all of those into here, you're gonna get fracture half length as, as meter. You're gonna get the width also as meter, but if you multiply by a thousand, it will give you millimeters and you will get net pressure in pascals. But if you divide it by a million, you will get a megapascal. So I propose that uh, to try to get the, the fracture half length. And, um, and then let's see if you can get some, uh, some realistic values. I'll, I'll give you a few more minutes, okay? Because we have, this one is a, the easy one. Uh, then we have to move on to the other, a little bit more complex problem. Yes. So, uh, yeah, mm is a million. Mm is a million. Yes. For the fracture? Half length? Yeah. You should get something in the order of a thousand meters okay. or thousands of feet. You get that? Yeah. What value did you get? For the one hour? Then Seven hundred? 700, okay. Um, that, that's a little bit long, but it's, it's one hour. So, yeah, you, you say that's correct? No, you should get like around 
Okay, so do, do you get the values around 1,000? Uh, Muhammad, you say it should be how much exactly? Uh, 1,524. So you guys get that value? No. No? Alright guys, well, I'll, I'll let you continue working on that, okay? Uh, you have one question? Yeah. One? 370. But uh, probably there is something running there because Muhammad says that's not the value. Nine hundred fourteen. So, so check your equations. You know there are many exponents in those equations, and make sure you get the right values. Okay. Um, so, uh, once you uh, solve this, even if you don't get the right equation or the right result right now, make sure that you check the solution with uh, Muhammad's solution, and and fix everything you have in there. But okay, let let's assume that uh, you have already fracture half length and width. Uh, I don't remember if I mentioned this, but for the PKN model, you can compute the fracture volume with an equation that tells you uh, that, let me get this over here. This is just a geometry problem, so gonna, let's not bother about finding the, the demonstration for that. But you can calculate that the fracture volume is going to be, I'm going to add it here at the bottom, the volume of the fracture of one wing is going to be equal to in general to the average width times the fracture half length times the height and it happens that for the uh, PKN fracture uh, and that's a, a given geometry this value is going to be pi over 5, the maximum width at the wellbore and at the center, times half length, times height. So, if you know the width at any time, you know the volume of the fracture. And once you get the width, and once you get the, the fracture length, uh, the fracture height is already fixed, so you, you know what the volume is. So the second part of the problem is that you compute how much water and uh, how much sand you need uh, in order to put into that one fracture. And no, actually it says total. So you compute with one fracture and then you multiply that times two. And the solution of that is 
similar to the one I have over here. So basically, you just compute two volumes, and the in the statement it tells you that it's a little bit different to what I have here again. So 90% is going to be water, and 10% is going to be sand. So in 90% of this volume is water, then you get directly what the volume is going to be. Uh, probably, you know, those those are very large volumes, so they may not make a lot of sense in your in your mind. But just keep in mind that you could compare that either to barrels to have a better idea about how much water that is, or I like to compare that to swimming pools. A swimming pool, a medium swimming pool, like in a regular apartment complex, is like about 100 meter cubes which would be something like uh, 600 barrels or so. Uh, that's, that's more or less the volume of a swimming pool. So for this particular fracture, and yours is going to be slightly different, you need about two, is two swimming pools of water to be pumped in that fracture to keep it open. Uh, because in this case, this is a very long fracture Although it's the width is not a uh, it's not a lot. It's about a fifth of an inch. The length is and the height are quite large. So you need quite a bit of water to open that fracture. You know that one of the main uh, issues with hydraulic fracture is you need a lot of water. And in regions where water is scarce, uh, water is very important and it's one of the main costs in. Uh, making those hydraulic fractures. The other part is the sand. And in this case, uh, in the statement is 10%, but in this one, I have 20%. Uh, for 20%, you can calculate the volume of that sand. And if you multiply the volume of that sand times the specific weight of sand, which if the sand is made out of quartz, is about 2.65, that will give you the weight of the sand. Usually sand is uh, moved to the fracturing places with trucks. Uh, nowadays, uh, instead of just moving uh, sand in, uh, in a truck, just dumping the, the sand directly in a truck and taking it from there, now they're just containers in which the sand is inside and you just put that container in place and uh, they have uh, automatic valves that, that they just open directly uh, out of that container uh, to be uh, mixed with the fracturing fluids. But this is a lot of sand, right? So uh, one truck can carry about 20 tons of, of sand. So in this case, notice that you need six trucks to put that amount of sand in that uh, fracture. I, I talked to, to one guy that even now, instead of using trucks, he's trying to move sand through pipes and through uh, uh, conveyor belts because it's, you know, such, um, it's so high the amount of sand that sometimes you need that it makes sense to move it that way. Uh, all right, so I hope that with this simple exercise, you get an idea about uh, how to compute fracture half length, uh, width and pressure you will need this pressure, for example, to design the surface pumps that you will need to do that fracturing job. And this is more of an exercise of volumetrics analysis. I'm sure you're gonna be able to solve this problem, okay? If probably something you can do is you can check with these same parameters, your equations and see if you get these same values. If you don't, it's because there is something wrong in your equations. You can do that uh, uh, before checking that with uh, Muhammad's uh, solution. Let's go now to the more complex problem. Um, in this case, I gave you what was a fracture height, but many times we do not that we do not know that a priori. We have to determine that, and how we determine that uh, with something that is called 
a stress log. A stress log is going to utilize the measurement of mechanical properties in the formation in order to determine what is the minimum principal stress. So the concept is very simple. The concept is that, uh, remember that we, most times we have tectonic strains that push the rock sideways. So if the Young modulus of the formations is all the same in this formation and that formation and this formation, the horizontal stress is going to be, for the same tectonic strain, is going to be more or less the same everywhere. There is no variation of Young modulus or Poisson ratio. The horizontal stress is going to be the same e everywhere. And the hydraulic fracture, remember, that always likes to grow in regions of the lowest principal stress. That's why it's perpendicular to S3. But also will seek regions of the lowest horizontal stress if the horizontal stress is a minimum principal stress. So in the opposite case, if you have formations that, for example, this one is stiff, this one is soft, and this one is stiff, as you have tectonic strain, you will have higher stress on the stiff rock than on the soft rock, because for the same deformation, the stiff rock is going to take more stress than the soft rock. Why? Because stress is equal to Young modulus times strain. For the same strain, the lower the stiffness of the rock, the lower the stress is going to be. So the minimum principal stress is going to have some variations with depth as well. And hydraulic fractures are going to seek for those variations. And they will always prefer to grow on the regions in which the minimum principal stress is the lowest also in vertical direction. So if you were to start a hydraulic fracture, for example, somewhere over here, it would grow preferentially in this region and it will go to upper and lower regions only when the net pressure inside the fracture is enough to overcome this barrier, this difference. If your net pressure is not too high, the fracture may just propagate constantly through in this boundary. So how do we determine now these uh, stress variations? Actually, you already know the solution. These are the equations that we use for computing stresses based on tectonic strains. But now what we're going to do is we're going to use the sonic velocities to calculate stiffness as a function of depth. And with this stiffness, and together with the vertical stress that we calculated previously, and with a tectonic strain, you're going to be able to determine the horizontal stresses, not just one value as we did before, but all these values as a function of depth. And usually in the field, you don't know what the value of tectonic strain is. But what you do know sometimes is what is the minimum principal stress from a uh, hydraulic fracture test, and sometimes what is the maximum stress from, for example, breakouts, as you did in your exam. With these values, you can calibrate what that tectonic strain is so you have a better model of what is the horizontal stress as a function of depth. And this is basically what you have to do, okay? So if, if you go to Canvas, uh, you will see that I posted a link over there that is going to take you to here. And here you have two files for those which are uh, faithful to Python and MATLAB. I I put a, a DAT file, so th this is just a text file. And for those of you that want to work with Excel, I put an Excel file. 
and I'm gonna download that one, okay? Because that's gonna be easier for me to work on right now. And this is real data from a relatively shallow field in which we have all the, the data that we need to determine that stress log, basically stress as a function of depth. All right, so let's get started. So download this file, okay? Uh, the first thing that I like that you do is, uh, again, to make our calculations easier, is to compute here what is BP, what is BS, uh, we're going to com convert these to the SI system and then we're going to convert it back to field units based on the slowness and from there I like that you compute what is the Poisson ratio, what is the Young modulus, and this one doesn't have any units, and this one we're going to compute it in, first we're going to compute in MPA, and then in PSI, using the equations that you have over here. Okay, so there you have BP uh, and BS and <coughs> dynamic Young modules and the dynamic Poisson ratio. So I'll help you with the first one. Uh, if we want velocity, then it's the inverse of this one. And if we want to convert that, uh, one feet is going to be that much meters and one microsecond is one second divided one million. So, uh, thank you. That gave me a value that doesn't make sense. Well, 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 okay. What's wrong here? So divided um, sense. So this is that's about two kilometers per second that makes sense okay. So you compute BS you compute BP BS and then with the other equations you compute dynamic Young modulus and the dynamic Poisson ratio and uh, there, you will get what are the dynamic values. So there is one more step involved in there. The dynamic values are not usually the actual values in the, in the formation that act over a long period of time and that may be also useful for hydraulic fracturing. Uh, the velocities that you measure with well logging, they involve very small strains like 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7. And th those are not the strain that usually deform rocks in geological time or when you do hydraulic fracturing. Those strains are closer to the ones that you use in the laboratory. So uh, there is going to be one more factor later on that you're going to have to convert these dynamic measurements to static measurements with 
a fac factor FDS which is usually less than one. And in the problem, uh, which is problem number five, I'm giving you, I'm giving you, giving you that value. Okay, so so you already you already know that, and I'm also giving you the tectonic strains. So everything left is just to compute stresses as a function of depth. If in case you don't remember the equation that we need to use, let me refresh that. This is going to be. Once you compute vertical stress, these are going to be these two equations over here. These two, okay? All right, so, so you can start working, and I'll work also here. So that's for shear, okay, makes sense. was on ratio so probably we'll need a little bit more of time to explain this how to analyze these stress logs but we have time for that on Monday. Oh, something very important, guys. What do you think about having our final exam the last day of class? Yes. 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 On the, that, that same Friday at uh, 1 p.m. as we have done so far. One hour, yes. Yes. One, one hour exam. Yes. 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 Okay. I don't, I don't like three-hour exams, they're too long. Okay, so, uh, yes? Question, is it going to be cumulative? It is cumulative in the sense uh, that you need to know things that we did before. And it was the same for the, for the second midterm, okay? Because what I saw uh, from grading the exam is that uh, many people did the, the ones that have a, a grade which is not so great, uh, that's because there were problems like, for example, in calculating a total stress or an effective stress. So if you did that, then that's just from the very beginning, very likely uh, you're gonna get uh, wrong results. I did take partial credit in some of those cases, but for the third midterm, you're gonna have to know uh, how to calculate total stresses, how to calculate effective stresses, uh, because you're gonna need those values later on, say, to compute a net pressure or, or to do, utilize, uh, or to make sense of other, the other concepts in hydraulic fracturing. Uh, so I think, uh, let me take advantage of to ex talk about the exam. Most of you, did uh, all of these uh, correctly up to here, and uh, up to there, I would say up to the deep. Some people didn't uh, do this one, but th that one doesn't, we did give you some partial credit for that one, uh, but it, it was a, a picky, picky question. So if you didn't get it, don't worry. Um, the solution here is that because it's extending in all directions the same, if you had normal fractures, they will be all with a strike perpendicular to the radius because it's extending the same in all directions. Sometimes you see that in normal faults where there is no predominant tectonic strain and those are called <laughs> polygonal faults. And actually the faults, they form as polygons. And for this one, it's very important that you know, you understand what's going on in here. Because I might give you, I, I might tell you uh, 
take this horizontal well and tell me in which direction you're going to drill a horizontal well bore for hydraulic fracturing. So by looking at this image of a vertical well bore, you have to know what is the direction of the stresses and how to place a horizontal well bore for hydraulic fracturing based on this data. Okay? Um, I would say 40% of you got this one wrong. And uh, uh, I, I understand that because probably this is not the thing that we put the most emphasis in in the well bore images, but we did put a lot of emphasis on this. If you just did this one correctly, I will give you half or more of the points. But it's very important that you also know about image logs. We talk about that. We didn't talk a lot, but we did talk about that. And it is in the notes. Most of you got this one right. And if you didn't get the wellbore width exactly to what I wanted, don't worry. You will see that even if you said 60 degrees, I consider that correctly. If you said 100 degrees, I consider that correctly. But what you should know this is that, again, this is a wellbore image, right? So from west to north, it's 90 degrees. And the wellbore width just comes directly from here. It's a fraction of that. So definitely it's less than 90. You could argue it's uh, somewhere between 90 to 60. And if you told me that uh, value, then I gave you that problem as uh, correct. So 90 was the right choice? I would say more than, it, it depends. I mean, you have to be picky. You have to say exactly where. I'm, I'm not looking for that, to, for you to tell me the exact number, but to tell you number, to tell me a number that, that makes sense. I mean, and something between 90 and 60 to me makes sense out here. So, again, uh, you, you have this already in Canvas. If you have any questions, just uh, send me an email. And uh, work on this uh, stress log. And we'll talk a little bit more about this on, on Monday. I, I have your exams, okay? Don't, don't leave yet. No, actually, I want to give it one by one, okay? So I have a few here.